Hello internet users and welcome back to another video. Today we are once again going to look for ways to max out our misery in a video game. Normally I focus on the Pokemon games, but this time I'm here to introduce someone foolish enough to try the same thing in a different series, Fire Emblem. Have fun! Or don't, cause that's kind of not the point. Hey, Mecha here. Let's say you're having a heated discussion with your friend about just how good he is at Fire Emblem. Let's say it gets to a point where he goes, I am so good at Fire Emblem, I can get myself out of any bad situation. What would be the best way to prove him wrong and shut him up for good? Probably by providing him with a game and a save file in which we set up a situation that is so bad that he cannot get out of it. In other words, we set up what is called a soft lock. A state of the game that is technically playable, but there is no way for the player to progress beyond a certain point. In this video, we are going to explore how we can best softlock our imaginary friend to make sure he has no way out. Time to settle this! Here we go! Of course, I can't make this kind of a video without giving a shout out to Picaspri, a YouTuber who often makes videos on this subject about softlocking yourself in Pokemon games. His series, Softlock Picking, has been a huge inspiration for this video, and if you haven't seen it already, you should go check it out. After finishing this video, of course. The Pokemon softlocks are usually done through limiting a player's options as much as possible. You do this by picking up and discarding all items in the available area, defeating all trainers, getting rid of all money earned, and finally by releasing almost all their Pokemon. The only Pokemon the player is allowed to keep is one that is incapable of helping them progress. The most well-known example is a low-level Magikarp that is unable to do anything other than Splash. The final steps are to save the game and finally to hand the game to a friend and say, hey dude, try to continue playing the save file, and then to laugh at them as they struggle to find a way out. The Fire Emblem equivalent would follow similar steps with a couple of changes. The part where we get rid of our items and money is basically the same. Fire Emblem usually allows you to drop weapons freely, so there's no problems there. But the part where we release our collectible monsters, yeah, we're going to have to intentionally sacrifice our characters for the sake of the softlock. Nothing to be done about it. Rest in peace, Rebecca. However, in Fire Emblem, we cannot just release our starters, also known as the Lords, since doing so causes a game over. But we can often leave them very underleveled and with no weapons. Basically, we turn them into low-level Magikarps. Are you afraid to die? And then we get to the part where we have to save the game. This is where it gets a bit complicated. In most Fire Emblem games, you cannot save in the middle of a battle, and you generally have the option to restart an entire chapter from the battle preparations. Often, what we have to do is use one map to prepare ourselves for a softlock in the next. For example, if I want to softlock myself, or the unfortunate recipient of my save file in Chapter 17, I need to take the aforementioned steps in Chapter 16, complete Chapter 16, save my game, and then hopefully the file will be softlocked in Chapter 17. However, not every map can be used to softlock someone. In fact, a lot of maps provide the player with a way to advance through the game, and of course we can't have that. But what exactly is it that keeps a map from being softlockable, and what makes a map perfect for trapping our friend in for eternity? Let's go through one of the Fire Emblem games chapter by chapter and see if we can figure this out. I'm going to use Fire Emblem 7, the Blazing Blade, as our guinea pig here. I'm your new hobby, is that it? You falling for me? Keep in mind that for every one of these maps, we're going to try and leave our friend with as few options as we can. That means we're going to keep Hector, Lynn and Elliewood at base level, and we're going to use up all of our gold and discard every single item that we can. This is easy to do with Elliewood and Hector, but if we try to do the same with Lynn, we run into a little problem. All the Lords have personal weapons, also known as PRF weapons, that only they can use. The Wolf Beal and the Rapier can be dropped or sold, so it's easy to get rid of them. But Lin's Mani Kadi is classified as treasure and has no monetary value, meaning we cannot drop it or sell it. There are ways around this though. When I realized that this could be a problem, my first instinct was to try and find ways to break the Mani Kadi while minimizing Lin's experience gain. This is actually pretty tricky to do, it has 46 uses and ideally we want her to do 0 damage so she only gains 1 EXP per battle. It's not the worst thing in the world if she gains the EXP since we could just rig her to get bad level ups but we'd really prefer if she just stays at a low level and gains no stats whatsoever. 
I actually spent a while trying to find enemies that she does zero damage to, and there are surprisingly few because the enemies with the highest defense tend to be the ones that the Manikari has effective damage against. As if I'd lose. But then I asked a couple friends for help, and one of them was like, dude, why don't you just trade her Manikari to another unit and then kill that unit off? And I was like, yeah, that is probably the easier solution. I was going to suggest all kinds of complicated things involving the mind glitch of all things, but in the end, this is the most simple and most effective way to get rid of the Manikari, as well as any other unsellable items that you want to get rid of. Dread. So, with that tangent out of the way, let's take a closer look at the maps in FE7. These are all the chapters in Hector Hard Mode. We'll take our time examining each one of them and see what it is that makes them good or bad to trap our friend in. Chapter 11 and Chapter 12 are disqualified right off the bat, as the whole early game squad joins in these. Generally, any map where a new recruitable character joins is going to be bad for a trap, since they often come with usable re-equipments that can be used to fulfill objectives, or be sold and thus converted into more useful weapons. Even if the new character isn't very good at fighting from the start, our friend could rig the RNG in their favor to make them good. They could get lucky critical hits, dodge fatal blows, and get good level ups, so Usually, if there is a new unit, this chapter isn't soft lockable, but there are exceptions. Chapter 13 has Guy as a recruitable character, but only if Matthew is alive, and we can kill him in one of the previous maps, so Guy is actually irrelevant. Yeah! However, keep in mind that there are two villages in this chapter, and one of them gives the player a really easy way out. If they can make it to the bottom village, they gain access to a mine, which can be used to perform the mine glitch. Now that would give them the ability to make all enemies drop their weapons and make the boss move off of his gate, easily breaking the lock. Chapter 13x is a survive mission. Missions with the defend or survive objective usually make for poor soft locks because all the player has to do to win is sit out the turn counter. The player isn't hindered much by their inability to kill the enemies, they just need to dodge enough attacks in order to win. This can be ridiculously unlikely, but with a lot of rigging, it's usually possible, so because of that, I'm generally going to mark these chapters as not fitting for a soft lock. If you try to trap someone in these, they might have to get very lucky to win, but there is almost always going to be at least a very, very small chance that they escape. Chapter 14 has two aspects that likely make it a poor soft lock. The first one is that it has Priscilla, who can be recruited by anyone visiting her village. Priscilla cannot fight, but she can sell her items and let you buy weapons for your lords to use. The other aspect that helps our friend escape is Urk, who is available as an NPC. Now, our friend won't be able to recruit Urk quickly since we're killing off Sarah, but Urk will still fight enemies using his Thunder Tome, and given enough luck, he could come close to routing the map. Urk can also be recruited if the player manages to get Priscilla over to him. Chapter 15 is a defend map, so we're skipping that one. Chapter 16 has the entire Lindus League rejoin us at the start of the map, so that one is definitely out. We can keep Chapter 17 on the list though, since if we kill Priscilla, we cannot recruit Raven, and that means we also cannot recruit Lucius. And stained with blood. However, there is a story event that occurs a couple turns into the chapter, where Lucius and the NPC soldiers that are with him manage to open the cell door and obtain weapons. So theoretically, Lucius can now fight. However, just making it through all the enemies in Chapter 17 using your unarmed lords requires ungodly amounts of luck, and will probably end with them getting surrounded by enemies even if they do survive. And Lucius himself doesn't even move, so the player would have to pick him up with one of the lords to even get him through the map. This debases us! Even if Lucius or the green soldiers were to somehow make it to the boss, they cannot win. The soldiers don't have enough attacking power to even do one damage, and the same goes for a base level Lucius. And since Lucius is an NPC, he cannot gain level ups. So, as the player setting the trap, we just need to make sure Lucius doesn't have a lot of magic, for example from playing Lin mode. By the way, full disclosure, not all the background footage you see here comes from me playing the game normally, in a legitimate way. Imagine how much time it would take me to play through every chapter normally, and setting up a softlock scenario for every chapter by killing off every other character, while also keeping the lords at base level. Yeah, no way. I have the assistance of some very powerful tools that let me replicate situations that are either impossible or theoretically possible but really difficult to show without hours and hours of RNG abuse. One of those tools is a script that lets me teleport characters around on a chapter. For example, to let the NPC soldiers in chapter 17 make it to the boss area without dying on their way there. This saved me a ton of time. This script was made by RolandMan1 and I could not have made this video without it. Another great tool I have is a special modified ROM that maximizes player luck. I don't mean the actual luck stat, what I mean is that it rigs the RNG in my favor automatically. 
If an attack from a player character or an NPC would have a chance to connect at all, it is automatically given a 100% chance to succeed. Conversely, if an enemy attacks and they don't have 100% hit, it automatically misses. The same applies to critical hits. If I can crit, I will. I posted a video on my channel a while ago to show it off, and it has been nice to try and see if a chapter can be cleared if the player gets as lucky as possible. This ROM hack was made by a fellow named Skryza, and with his help we've been able to 100% determine whether some of the chapters were soft lockable or not. Both of these tools saved me a ton of time. Now, instead of repeatedly RNG abusing, hoping to get the right outcome, I can spend that time doing more productive things. Of course, neither of these tools are being used for anything but experimentation, and our actual victim is not going to have access to them, but I wanted to mention them just to be transparent. Anyway, let's go back to the chapter list. Chapter 17x can be scrapped on the account of the battle-ready Kanas joining with an expensive secret book. This book, you see? <sighs> Not to mention the fact that the goal of the map is only to reach Fargus and talk to him, so there is no boss that needs to be fought. And chapter 18 is on a timer, so we don't need to spend time on that one either. Chapter 19 is interesting. Dart joins us from the start carrying a steel axe and a hand axe, and there is nothing we can do about it, so this one is probably not soft lockable. He's not exactly the most reliable at disposing of enemies, or even surviving given his low hit and avoid rates, but if your player gets lucky enough, he could get through to Uhai. His chances of actually beating Uhai are slim, but again, not impossible. You could also get some assistance from Fiora, who flies in a couple turns into the map. Preventing the recruitment of Fiora is easy, you know, we just kill off Florina, but Fiora can still fight as an NPC. She's even worse against Uhai than Dardis though, but given an infinite amount of RNG abuse, this unlikely pair could beat chapter 19. In fact, Skryza managed to clear the chapter using the aforementioned ROM hack and by giving Dart 100% growths. Just to give you an idea of how degenerate these kinds of clears are. Disgusting! Sure, it is super, super unlikely to happen in a normal playthrough, but the point is, it's not impossible. If you lock your friend into chapter 19x, you might be worried about the goddess icon they can get by visiting the ruins, but thankfully this item doesn't do anything to help you complete the chapter since there are no shops. Similarly, there is no reason to try and stop them from getting the Ryan's bolt that the boss of the last chapter drops. As far as I can tell, there is no way to complete chapter 19x as long as the player isn't given any weapons to use. In chapter 19xx, there is some droppable treasure, but no way to obtain it as long as we rid the player of any usable weaponry. Funnily enough, this chapter has a potentially interesting out to a soft lock, the Ballistas. If you leave your cocky friend with Will or Rebecca alive, they could be used to shoot some of the thieves and perhaps get some of the droppable items, though from what I can tell there isn't anything that will enable the player to beat the boss or fight their way to him. Chapter 20, Dragon's Gate is also going to stay on the list of soft lockable chapters. Even though Legault joins here, he starts so far away. Getting to him in time when we've gotten rid of all of our items should be impossible. You'll be dead soon. We can scrap near resolve though, since Ninian joins there. She cannot fight, but she joins with an elixir that we can sell, and then we can use that gold to buy some weapons. And that's not even mentioning all the other obtainable items in that chapter. Kinship's Bond is another defend map with three new characters that we cannot lock the player out of, so that one is a no-no too. Next up is Living Legends, the desert chapter. Not only do we get a recruitable Hawkeye with a killer axe, but it also has NPC pens capable of killing most of the enemies on the map, so this one probably is not soft lockable. Genesis has no new characters though, and even though Hawkeye is forced into it, we can get rid of his killer axe and anything else he might be able to use beforehand, so this one should be an easy soft lock. Fourfanged Offense has two different versions, depending on the level of the Lords. For the previous chapters, we've been assuming the Lords are left at base level, and in that case we end up in the Lloyd version. In this one, Wallace appears as an NPC. I tackled this one with the maximum luck ROM hack, and from what I can tell, it's impossible to actually beat. Even with the player characters dodging everything the enemies throw at them, they get surrounded very easily. I'm stuck! What is my life?! Only Lin can recruit Wallace, and since the enemy prioritizes her when choosing who to attack due to her low HP and defense, she gets surrounded easily. That means Wallace will stay an NPC, and he will never make his way to Lloyd before his weapons run out. He comes with a Silver Lance and a Hand Axe, but as an unpromoted knight he can only use the former, which only has 20 uses. Even if he were to make his way to Lloyd, he prioritizes attacking other enemies since they have lower stats. It doesn't help that Wallace doesn't have crit on Lloyd, and that Lloyd can one-round Wallace with ease. Don't blame me for your fate! 
This chapter does have several villages, including one that gives an earth seal. That could be sold at the vendors for 10,000 gold and be used to buy weapons for the lords, which they could then use to gain the experience needed to level up and provide a potential escape. However, the villages are impossible to reach without the lords getting surrounded, and there is also a bandit that will destroy villages if he's given enough time, so this one really is a softlock. If we want to lock our friend into the leanest version of this chapter instead, we will need the combined level of our lords to be 50 or higher. It sucks that we have to give the lords level ups, but we can at least make sure that they're bad ones. It is theoretically possible to get zero stat level ups in FE7, but the game does its best to prevent it. If you get unlucky enough to miss all your stat growths on a level up, the game rerolls all of them. And if you still miss a single stat, the game will do another reroll. So we're probably better off just getting single stat level ups for our victims. You know, as I'm writing this, I am now realizing that we've been going about this theoretical softlock thing slightly wrong. Leaving the lords at base level is pretty mean, but it's even meaner if we get them to level 20 without a single stat up. That way, they can't get even higher stats. Generally, getting enough XP to level up without any weapons is borderline impossible to begin with, but I think putting the lords at a higher level while keeping their stats low adds a nice extra layer of torture. Now, once again, this map has a village with an earth seal that can be sold at vendors, but this time there is no meddling NPC. Instead, all we have to deal with is Geats, an enemy warrior, but if we just kill off Dart beforehand, he's just an enemy like any other. This chapter looks pretty open at a first glance, but it's actually filled with choke points. For example, you cannot walk between these two shops over here, which means it's very easy for lords to get stuck between enemies and intraversible terrain. Skryza managed to visit the Orion's Bolt village, but there was no way to avoid being surrounded after that. The fact that this chapter has so many enemy wyverns really isn't helping, since they have such an easy time flying over everything and locking you in place. In Crazed Beast, we can ignore Farina, since she requires 40,000 gold to join. Since one of the first things we do when setting up the lock is getting rid of our gold, Farina is effectively unrecruitable. After all, the chapter itself doesn't offer nearly as much gold. There is a village with an Elysian whip as well as a couple of shops, however it is practically impossible to reach these with three disarmed base level lords, as they have to walk all the way around the map through the ranges of tons and tons of enemies, including the boss of the chapter. If the lords could cross the water of the lake, they could avoid all that, but unfortunately, they cannot. They can walk across rivers, but that is a different type of terrain than what we have here. Unfulfilled Heart is one of those maps where it looks like the game wants you to make soft locking impossible. First of all, it's a survive chapter, and that alone basically disqualifies it. You also get two promoted characters at the start, Pent and Louise. They come bearing gifts too. Their inventories are worth a lot of money, and then you're also given a heaven seal as the map starts. We're skipping this one. Pale Flower of Darkness gives the player the option to recruit Harkon or Karel, and both can be recruited by one or more lords. They appear pretty late into the chapter though, and you probably cannot reach them without fighting through several enemies first, so this chapter is still soft lockable in theory. I only really tested the Kenneth version, the one where you have to seize, but the Jeremy version where you have to route should be impossible as well. I only went to the Kenneth version because it's the one the game sends you to if you have no Guiding Ring or Hero Crest users alive. Then there's Battle Before Dawn, which is technically a defend objective, but since inaction on the player's end results in the death of Zephiel and thus the game over, I'm not gonna scrap it right away like I did with the other defend maps. The Lords can recruit Nino, Do my best. but if we properly run the player out of weapons, then it should be impossible to reach Nino before she or Zephiel dies. However, if we use the ROM hack to rig the RNG, all the NPCs, including Zephiel, survive just fine. It takes almost perfect luck to do that, but in practice I don't think it's possible for the RNG to be this nice to the player. At some point or another, Zephiel or one of the lords is going to die to the many, many enemies, and that will be a game over. So even though this map is on a timer, I think we can softlock our friend in this one. The guy in chapter afterwards, Knight of Farewells, has Jafar join at the start of the map. This cannot be stopped since Jafar's recruitment and survival is a condition to get into this chapter in the first place. So Jafar joins with a Killing Edge, but if we get rid of everything else it will be the only weapon the player has access to. The Killing Edge has only 20 uses, and this chapter definitely has more than 20 enemies standing between you and a throne. <laughs> so I think we can still trap our friend in this one for eternity. I reckon Cog of Destiny falls in the same category as Pale Flower of Darkness. It has a recruitable character in Vida, but she only appears once you've advanced very far into the map. In order to recruit her, you have to move Eliwood or Lynn towards the area near the shrine, where the most dangerous enemies are, and then you need to have Hector talk to her to recruit her. This is not going to end well even with the best of luck. 
Even when I managed to get Lin and Elliwood into the reinforcement zone that triggers Vida, I encountered another hilarious problem. I had reached the enemy cap of 50. This stops all future reinforcements from spawning, and because of that, Vida would not appear. Since we don't have any weapons to kill enemies with, the only way to unlock Vida is to never let any reinforcements come. The only route that leads Lin and Elliwood to the Vida zone, marked here as zone 4, is by moving slowly across the rivers, but that just gets him surrounded in the end. The chapter does have a village with a warp staff, which we can use to sell for some good weapons, so potentially if the player manages to both recruit Vida and get to that area, something could be possible. But you do have to make it to the village by turn 6, otherwise this brigand is going to destroy it. Even if you manage to recruit Vida, she only comes with a single spear with 15 uses, and once that one runs out, she's just as defenseless as the Lord's. The only way out is to sell either her spear or the warp staff and then buy a bunch of iron lances for her, which you can then use to wipe out enemies one by one. Unfortunately, this armory does not sell javelins, so this will be a very slow process. All while the characters face ridiculously high chances of death every single turn. In practice, this chapter is just impossible. By the way, if you're trapping someone in this chapter, make sure you do it in a save where you've been to Night of Farewells. This will give you the opportunity to actually discard the Heaven Seal that you get at the end of Battle Before Dawn, whereas otherwise you might have to sell it and give them money to work with. The Berserker is a map where you can only deploy the freshly promoted Hector and one other character. As long as you leave them with no usable weapons or chest keys, there will be no way for them to obtain any treasure or kill the boss. While it is possible for some of the enemies to get killed through the poison inflicted by the gas coming out of the walls, they will not drop their item unless they are defeated in combat, so even that is not an out. Fun fact? You can use Nils for this chapter, and he joins with the same items as Ninian. It's not going to help you escape the soft lock, but I thought I would mention it. We can skip the next two chapters, since they are both on a time limit. In Sands of Time, all you have to do to win is protect the throne for 11 turns, which is going to be unlikely but not impossible for someone to pull off if they just park the lords around it. Battle Preparations is the easiest chapter in the game. You get 30,000 gold at the start, which you get to spend on weapons, and to win, press end turn 5 times. It's the exact opposite of the kind of chapter we're looking for. The next map that isn't on the timer is Chapter 32, Victory or Death. On this chapter, you get a free Earth Seal from Nils, even if you kill them off like I did, but this doesn't matter. The only shop left in the game is the secret shop, which we can lock our friend out of by making sure he doesn't have the member card. Even if you manage to get in, the shop doesn't sell any weapons. This map does have Renault as a recruitable character that can actually fight, however reaching the ruins he resides in without any weapons should be impossible, especially since you have to get there in time. By turn 6 enemy phase, a bandit destroys the ruins, causing Renault to leave, and by turn 11 he will escape even if the ruins are still intact. And the other ruins don't give you any weapons, so despite all these aspects that make it look like this map shouldn't be soft lockable, it is, and there is no way for someone without weapons to get Limstella off the seize point. The last map before the final chapter is Value of Life. This is another chapter where you have to defeat the boss with no possible avenues of escape, and thus another easy softlock. Now the final chapter seems like a lost cause for softlocks. After all, this is when you get Magic Santa, who comes bearing the gifts of Durandal, Sol Kadi and Armads for the Lords, as well as Aureola and Forblaze. Initially, I had this chapter written off as a free win for our victim, because those things seem like get out of jail free cards. And they are, at least for part 1. As long as Athos has luck on his side, he can beat the entire chapter, and the lords can either hide from most enemies or get lucky enough to dodge their attacks. If our friend is patient enough with rigging the RNG, he could probably route the map and defeat Nurgle, even on a real cartridge. However, if he does manage to do so, you should do your best to egg him on and try to get him to beat the game. After all, there is one last challenge left for him, the Fire Dragon, and I'm confident that our friend cannot actually beat him. The Fire Dragon has a massive 120 HP, which Athos is nowhere near able to one-up kill. Normally, Athos makes short work of him with the Lunatone, but we're obviously not giving our friend access to that. Instead, he's going to have to make do with the tomes he's given in the final chapter. That includes Aureola and Forblaze, which are in Athos' inventory, and the S-rank weapons dropped by the various bosses, Excalibur, Luce, and Gespenst. None of these weapons are strong enough to defeat the Fire Dragon. Gespenst gets Athos doubled and one-rounded because it's so heavy, Aureola and Forblaze do effective damage but not nearly enough to KO the dragon in two hits, and they don't have a chance to crit, like, none at all. 
And this actually seems like it's by design. Athos has exactly 22 crit with these weapons, and the Fire Dragon has 24 luck, which is just a little more of what is needed to negate all that crit. The last two tomes don't get the job done either. Loose and Excalibur can crit, but they do less damage with a critical hit than Four Blaze does with a normal hit. Meanwhile, the Fire Dragon has an absurdly accurate weapon, easily reaching 100 hit on any of your characters, including Athos. He does 39 damage in one hit, completely ignoring your defenses, meaning Athos dies in two rounds. And don't forget, we're not giving our friend access to any healing whatsoever. And if you're wondering, Hector is totally incapable of finishing the job. He does 3 damage with the Armads at base level. There is no escape! I think this is the most cruel soft lock of them all. You make your friend think he has a chance by soloing the final chapter with Athos, forcing them to get lucky several turns in a row, only for him to be defeated by the final boss. Now that is satisfying. So, let's make up the balance, shall we? In how many FE7 chapters can we realistically soft lock our cocky friend? By my count, there are 13 chapters out of the 31 total that we can definitely lock them in, with no means of escape, a little over a third of the game. In these chapters, there is just no way for them to complete the objective, and even if they get extremely lucky, the best they can do is get their lords surrounded by enemies that will eventually kill someone. The 18 chapters that remain range from faint possibilities to straight up impossible. The straight up impossible chapters include maps where it's pretty obvious from turn 1 that there is no way out. Those are nice for a quick prank and mostly includes maps where you have to defeat the boss, but the ones that I think are the most interesting are the ones where there is a straw that our friend can try to grasp onto, only for them to realize that they actually cannot win. Chapters like Four Fanged Offense, where it looks like there's a way out by visiting a village and then selling an item you get so that the lords can maybe buy weapons, only for them to realize eventually that they can get surrounded no matter how hard they try. Or like the final chapter, where it looks like Athos can just solo the whole thing only to get stopped by the final boss himself. Come to think of it, since I had to try all these different methods to see if one could escape, I kinda did all these things to myself, so I actually spent all this time trying to trap myself and then torture myself for all these hours trying to escape from these traps. Damn, that, that's kind of deep. You know, I might have made a mistake somewhere. There might have been a way to trap someone in a chapter that I missed. Or perhaps there was a way to escape one of these traps that I didn't see before. Or maybe you know a fun way to softlock someone in a completely different Fire Emblem game. If that's the case, please let me know in the comments. And while you're down there, maybe drop a like and subscribe to let me know that you appreciate this kind of content. So I know I should make more videos like this in the future. Before I sign off, I have a couple of people to thank for making this video possible. First of all, I'd like to thank Jack for editing this huge video for me. Editing is something that I can do, but he is one of the many people who can do a much better job. So thanks to him for making the video look super good. I'd also like to thank Rin for making the thumbnail and shoutouts to Picaspri for lending his voice for the intro. And of course, huge thanks to my Patreons for making these videos possible. A tier Patreons like the ones currently on your screen get access to sneak peeks of big videos like this as well as other progress updates and goodies. But of course I want to give an extra big shout out to my S tier Patreons, Lucas, Blue Caterade, Giant Corkscrew, Heliosan, Boots42, Jacob, Corey, Reese's Puffs, Ice Lake, Crimson Blader, Moo, Seraph, Skyler JB, P. Vladias, Scott Mitchell, Command List, Nikhil, Jesus Kun69, Stuart Graves and Hunty Shurix. I couldn't do all of this without your help. And last but not least, thank you for watching and until next time. See ya!